to the uh, second of a series of tiny homes in the Northwest Eco Building. Building Building Guild. Thanks a lot for coming and uh, sharing in this discussion uh, about tiny homes tonight and about sustainability. Um, we appreciate you guys uh, coming in and uh, joining us. I, I want to give a shout out to the volunteers. It takes a good dozen of us to pull this event together. And uh, so I want to um, thank uh, the volunteers that have helped uh, push, uh, pull this together. Um, everything from setting up the furniture, getting the food, uh, putting the presentations together, recruiting for presenters. And um, it's, it's a really invigorating group when you, uh, when you get a chance to uh, talk to anybody on the committee. They're really enthusiastic about what they do and uh, who's doing what. Uh, so uh, hopefully you'll get something out of this and uh, get um, excited about what we're doing and um, uh, contribute in some way. Uh, of course, we appreciate the donations that keeps the lights on, pays for the rent. And, uh, and now it actually helps us do some streaming, which Aliko is doing for us tonight. Um, okay, so I want to point out um, the volunteer of the month. This person has worked tirelessly on, tirelessly on the greenhouse tour, the tiny house working group, and this education series. And I don't know where she got all the time to do that, especially with family visiting. But uh, our hero tonight is Wendy Ferry. Wendy? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, now, Wendy uh, did something really interesting. She, because she knew uh, there was a lot of hunger for uh, resources on tiny houses, she put together a resources list which uh, I believe she has some copies. How many did you bring? Um, oh, okay. Okay, very good. Okay, so um, uh, go ahead and, and grab that. Um, we do want you to sign up for either the newsletter or uh, if you can, volunteer a couple hours and helping us pull these things together. So um, uh, please sign up. Uh, again, uh, and uh, see if you have some time to uh, give us a hand. Um, as you can see, we're struggling to get the room set up, so anyone that has some expertise in um, getting AV put together, we can sure to use that. And there's all, all kinds of uh, little chores that need to get done. So sign up uh, for uh, on our volunteer list. Um, <coughs> okay. Um, <coughs> I wanted to mention a couple other things. Uh, so Doug Kennedy, Doug, can you raise your hands? So Doug is the person that does the setup. So if you have some time to come in early and help you with the setup, uh, getting the food displayed, getting the tables put together, talk to Doug. If there's anything to do with um, renewing your membership, Eric Tomasian, are you here? Yeah, so Eric uh, can help you with that. Um, Let's see, and then I am looking for a stage manager. <laughs> so if you, if you have some inclination to help with that, um, getting the AV set up and just coordinating this meeting um, on the day of the event, I would really appreciate that. Um, okay, and uh, Laura, are you here? Yeah. Laura, so can you give us a, a brief one? Okay, John, sure. <laughs> Two different things quickly. Um, we've just started the initiative process for the Carbon Fee Initiative campaign, Initiative 1631. This, much like the Carbon Tax Initiative we had two years ago, is somewhat similar, but it's called the fee. Very important tactical difference because fees are more popular than taxes. So this one's much more likely to pass. Um, there's a great deal of information. It's a much larger coalition of people involved with it. People in the Democratic Party, uh, tribal groups, uh, people of color, low income groups, Democratic Party, environmental, green building groups supporting it. Strongly encourage you to consider uh, getting involved with this campaign if you got a little bit of time. 
we need to get 300,000 some signatures in before the end of June. It's kind of a short time period. And I think this one has a real good chance of passing much better than the last one. And I'm just going to pass around this if you have some inclination, or I'll pass around a volunteer sheet as well. It would be great if you could sign it. As we go around. And the other thing I want to say is um, I'm a, a green building contractor, and on the tour, there's a Phantom Lake passive house on the tour, which is over in Bellevue. I know it's where you got to go across the bridge to get there, but it's worthwhile. This particular project is the only passive house on the tour that's a behind-the-walls um, tour. Because the time in the tour this, ha this year happens to be right before we insulate and right when we're in the middle of the insulating, so you can see all the, most of the details. So it's a good opportunity. Phantom Lake Tour, Tour Site E4. Thank you. Hello, my name is Laura Elfline. I'm a sponsor tonight with my company Mighty Energy, and I am the uh, Northwest Green Home Tour Seattle Chapter uh, Chair of the event this year. And just wanted to make a call out for the tour. It's this Saturday. This Saturday already. Woo! <laughs> and Sunday. And uh, so Saturday will be east side sites, like John was mentioning, and um, south and, and west Seattle sites. And then Sunday will be all the north end sites, sort of north of downtown, and split up like that. We do still have some volunteer roles for day of as site readers. It's a really great way to just sort of dip your feet into volunteering with the guild and, and see how awesome we are. And, and then be able to also hang out with some great architects and builders and suppliers that are hosting the site. There's always like this wave of attendance. So there's always like mm, 10, 30 minutes of downtime. They can chit chat and get really pick their brains. Um, so there's definitely a number of sites. John sites one, actually I have a Mighty Energy and um, Red Cottage Studios up in the northeast or northwest have a site that needs some help um, and about five others that need some um, readers to come for four hours and um, just help out at the site. Um, the tiny house, uh, well, the tiny house village in Georgetown village, yep, tiny house village in uh, Georgetown. Uh, sponsored by Green Green Tools, King County Green Tools, and hosted by Lehigh, um, needs some help. Um, and also, I want to mention that we have on the tour this year um, Seattle's first multifamily passive house in Columbia City. So that would definitely be a really great one to go check out. So I'll pass around some cards to help remind you about uh, tour opportunities and. Um, one more thing that I'll mention is that we're also ramping up the Green Building Slam and Summit this fall, for this fall, and so it's a great opportunity if you're new to green building and wanting to connect with folks in a deeper way. It's a great way to meet a lot of different folks. We have lots of call-outs to different businesses and, and chat with them about their projects and try to get them to submit from both of those events. So it's a really great way to introduce yourselves and, and learn a lot. So thank you. There's also a fight in Wenatchee. Uh, Yakima. <laughs> there is a group uh, that's been put together and been working on tiny houses for a couple of years now, and I wanted to introduce you to them because they are uh, looking into the possibility of doing a tiny house community. So, Susan? <coughs> Hi, my name is Susan Russell, and this is Denise. I'm Denise Henriksen. Okay, so I, we had a vision of a tiny home village. We saw not a lot done in the city to house the homeless, and there was no transparency on the money meant to help the homeless. So we are creating an extremely affordable housing village in King County. And what our hey. vision... Our fit, hey, hey, yeah, okay, um, it's getting worse and worse year after year. But anyways, our vision is to build a sustainable permaculture tiny home village with its own economic engines to sustain without depending on state, city, or federal funding. Woo! That's all right. Yeah. That's all right. That's all right. Housing. Woohoo! <laughs> and, um, and I really want to... Thank the Northwest Eco Builders Guild. About a year ago, Susan walked in here after a tiny house um, presentation or for, during a tiny house presentation 
and said, what's happening for, for people who are homeless? And after that meeting, a bunch of folks met and talked. We all talked in the back, and we started meeting, and we've been meeting ever since. And we just took a tour down to Eugene to, to walk through Emerald Village. And we are so inspired. We're, we're working on a collaborative agreement with them where they're going to help us. They're working on their third community. Um, and so they've already done it. And they did it with, not for, people. And so you're all invited to join us because we're just doing this by building uh, this team that is just growing and it's fantastic yeah. and you're all uh, welcome to be part of it yeah. and one of the keys to this is we're not going to build it for you we're going to build it with you because we believe in sweat equity and the value it brings to everyone so anyways yay thanks Susan um, I wanted to point out one more Tiny House community that you may have heard about, and it's up and running, Eric. Hey everyone, I'm Aaron, and show of hands, who's heard of the Quixote Village in Olympia? Very cool. Cool. Well, I have really good news. That Quixote community is expanding. Building two more, two more villages this year, and we're looking for collaborators, we're looking for ideas, we're looking to build community. So just be aware that that's happening, and I'd love to talk more and answer questions and get connected if you, if you want to help out. My card will be on the, uh, the Eco Building Guild table over there. My name is Aaron again. Thank you. I'd like to really thank everybody for coming tonight. And we set up a double resource table over there, and hopefully uh, we had enough resource guides. If you need one, please stop and grab one. We're really trying to pull together um, the different groups that are working on this problem and create a, a general consensus, consensus of where we can go to get the information we need so we're not recreating the wheels all the time. And then one of our members is also putting together a potential podcast to deal with this issue. And it should be a phenomenal uh, opportunity down the road to hear people that are involved uh, reaching out and showing others what they can be doing. And with that, as we think about building our uh, tiny houses, one last thing. Uh, Pat, if you wouldn't mind passing those out. Uh, again, many of you have already uh, taken this course and we appreciate it. It's one thing to build a house. It's another to build a healthy home for the occupants that will be in it. And some of the challenges with our unhoused, our underhoused, and just in general housing is uh, we're not building truly healthy houses. Uh, here's a, a flyer for a course that's going to be coming up in uh, late September, October. It's an eight-week healthy homes training for building professionals and those that would like to learn more about who should go into our homes as we're designing and building them. So uh, feel free and uh, some really early bird specials uh, for our Guild and Master Build members. So thank you very much and thanks for coming. We have this year, we are going on two tours and there's another tour down in Olympia. Chris, do you want to announce that? Sure. Hey everybody, my name is Chris Van Allen. I'm the Executive Director for the Northwest Eco Building Guild. As you can hear from everything that has been announced, there's so much going on with this organization. We're really growing and changing and, and really adapting to, the, to really help to transform the market, not just add some more green buildings here and there, but to really uh, address climate change, to address homelessness. And we need all of you to get involved as much as possible. We've got these tours. They're great opportunities to meet everybody and get involved. Um, the tour that Pat just mentioned, I'm helping organize in Tacoma and Olympia. It's just two weeks after the tour that's coming up this coming weekend. So if any, anybody here from the South Sound area or get down there pretty often, 
not too many. A couple. Okay, great. Well, I'd love to see you on the green, the South Sound Green Tour. The, um, Eric's going to tell you about our next, uh, our next symposium in the series. Anyway, there's just a bunch of opportunities to learn, to teach, to engage with the community and make a difference for the environment and for the equity that, uh, in terms of access to healthy, affordable buildings. So, hope you'll become a member of the Eco Building Guild. It's easy. Just go on ecobuilding.org and click join. Uh, we need as much support and involvement as we can get. So, uh, ask back to Pat. That's our awesome MC. Thanks, Chris. Okay, um, just want to give you a rundown of what's coming up uh, in the next uh, couple of months. Uh, May 23rd, we have uh, a, pre a presentation on battery technology for home and community storage. And uh, John is uh, leading that session, and he, I know he does really good research. And on May 30th, we have a symposium going on on mechanical systems. Eric, do you want to talk about that? Hi, my name is Eric. I'm a project coordinator with the Northwest, Northwest Eco Building Guild. Um, and one of the things that we've really changed this year for 2018 and going forward is a quarterly symposium series. Um, this event tonight will kind of scratch the surface on a lot of tiny home um, issues and, uh, and economic policies, but um, and, and ways that people, you know, figure out their economics for um, this. But we're really not going to dive super deep into the into the the nitty gritty because we have three speakers, each of them get 20 minutes to a half an hour and it goes pretty fast. Um, we really want to improve the, the deep dive learning opportunities. So every quarter we're doing a different symposium. Last uh, February we had one on window systems. People who want better insulation or high performance windows. Um, May 30th at University of Washington Bothell at Mobius Hall. Um, at 1230 we're doing one on uh, balanced heat recovery with ventilation, um, as well as um, uh, highly high performance uh, water heating systems. Um, we've had these speakers come before. Um, these are really cutting edge technologies, uh, ways that we can save a lot of energy on our uh, buildings, uh, which are taking a huge uh, draw now. Um, and if you, if you want to uh, work with companies that are providing systems for high efficiency and high performance, um, if you are looking for graduating students to enter into the mechanical engineering field, um, if you are looking to familiarize yourself with some of the cutting edge technologies, um, it's a really good uh, program. Again, May 30th, uh, 1230 um, at UW Buffalo. Great, thanks Eric. Um, so uh, these symposiums are deep dives. They last about four hours. You're going to talk to uh, experts in, in each uh, uh, system that we're uh, looking at. And you mentioned uh, some uh, ventilation systems. Uh, I think they're covering solar as well. But anyway, uh, May 30th. Then on June 27th, the last of our tiny house series is going to cover legal issues. And we've got, um, we've got a person coming from uh, the city. Uh, to talk about what they're doing on, on the legal side. So it rounds out uh, one of the biggest hurdles in tiny houses is how do you get through the legal barriers. Then in July, where <coughs> the session is on optimizing heat and ventilation systems. Okay, so <laughs> sorry about that. It's a lot of announcements. Um, so tonight, uh, we have a panel that's going to be talking about, number one, the crisis that we're in in Seattle with how and Hannah's going to cover that and then we're going to jump into some solutions um, with Sam from Green Canopy Homes. Uh, they have been doing some real cutting-edge thought leadership on this problem and uh, tonight we get to share uh, in their thinking. Um, so Hannah are you ready? Okay. So let's get going with uh, the first. Go ahead. Hello, I'm just going to pull up my presentation here real quick. All right, so my name is Hannah. Um, I am a marketer, and I uh, hope you guys can see. I'll try to move around a little bit and still stay in the camera, but 
while also clicking my thing. <laughs> um, I am, I worked in marketing in the mortgage industry before I moved into working in more of the green space and sustainability. So um, I was really excited about this topic. I know it's a huge issue that so many are concerned about. So I'm hoping to kind of give everyone a broad view of the issue from a marketing perspective. What is some of um, the mechanisms that are at play here and how are they affecting us uh, everyday people in our community and our state. So I'll just dive right in. Um, here I just have a little visualization of the demand versus the supply. In Washington State right now we have approximately 7 million people and um, the supply of housing units is hovering around 3 million. So there's a big discrepancy there. Um, you think sometimes, oh, two and a half people versus household, but with the advent of Airbnb and rental properties, we're seeing that that's just not cutting it. So our 3 million units are struggling to serve the 7.3 million residents. Um, just last year, we added 40 units, which is awesome, 40,000 units, excuse me, but we also added 126 thousand people. So um, we have a lot of interest in people moving to Seattle, moving to Washington. We have a great economy depending on how you look at it. <laughs> so um, definitely that's a challenge and considering the migration and immigration in Washington. And a few other key points I threw up there, um, hopefully you can see it. It's 62% owner occupied and 52% um, of the new units in Washington were in family structures which is an important piece that we'll come back to. Also, 75% of new housing was in metro areas, and King County led the way with uh, approximately 15,000 new units. One of the mechanisms we see here at play is that there's less inventory in the last seven years. Um, home inventory fell about 11,000 units. Yes. Is this needing to scoot? Okay. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Um, and hopefully that's still working. Okay. And then, so part of that reason that we're having issues with the home supply is that with the Great Recession, um, we saw a lot of homes be bought up by investors and be converted into rental properties. This little graphic here is a little snippet that I took from Fannie Mae, and that's what their research suggested was that more than a million owner-occupied starter homes have been now converted to rental units. So that's a big piece um, that's creating issues for us. Another component here is that you can see on this graph that um, the, what this is showing here is this bar is that this is homes that are considered starter homes because they have 200 square feet or less. So those are bigger homes and those are still, you know, pretty balanced in terms of owned versus rented. But for um, these smaller homes, the majority of them have been converted to rentals. So that's just another way of visualizing that. We won't dwell there. Yes, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 2,000 square feet or less. Um, so also days on the market is another component that we're competing with. There's more competition. Seven years ago, there was the average Seattle home was on the market for about 100 days is the average between, you know, versus new construction or existing. And today, that's hovering around 20, even less for some, depending if it's um, existing homes are even less, which is presenting a lot of challenges for our community members, especially low income, considering that most home loans are, can't be closed in 20 days. So that's putting a lot of stress on lenders and anyone that's using financing to purchase homes. Uh, additionally, rising costs, we see that the price per square foot, this is, these are, this data is from Redfin, and um, the rising cost is price per square foot has risen from $150 to $300. And this is for Washington, Seattle area specifically, and residential. So this is just kind of an overview of the supply issue. We have 
um, fewer homes for sale, more people in the market, and therefore higher prices. So we're seeing that sort of inflation. <laughs> and the effects of that is, um, I really think this is powerful. Some of you guys have interest if you're a real estate agent, or even if you're a builder, you want to have a good handle on the market and kind of sniff it away. I really recommend checking out Zillow's um, research tab. And they, they publish these little two-page sheets on the rental market and on the housing market. And this one is highlighting, this is just a piece of it, um, that Seattle home values, this is for the metro area, are at $500,000, whereas the national home value is at $200,000. So the average, excuse me, median uh, Seattle home value is 2.3 times higher than the national average. And the yearly appreciation in Seattle is nearly double as well. So if you bought a home last year, your home is approximately valued at 14% higher. So great investment for those people that bought last year, but definitely challenging for people trying to enter the market, especially first time home buyers. <laughs> so here I did a little bit more analysis. Um, actually, if you're looking at Seattle, the city, the median price is far higher at 740000 And um, I compared that to income data for Seattle. And 75% of people in Seattle make less than $150,000 per year. You're wondering where that figure came from. I reverse engineered how much money you would need to have on an income basis in order to afford financing for a home of that price. I'm also a loan officer, so she helped me with that. <laughs> um, and yeah, you're going to need about $160,000 of income per year in order to afford that home. So we're leaving out 75% of Seattle residents, if only, you know, a lot. So we see that there's a huge discrepancy there. <coughs> Um, digging a little deeper into the income information I found was pretty interesting, especially if we're trying to unearth what opportunities there are for builders, for developers, um, where this mismatch lies. Um, we see that household income, there's more than a million people in Washington State that make less than $50,000 per year. And more than, or 69% that make less than 100 k So, People that are currently living in Seattle aren't able to stay there. And obviously, a lot of us are in this room maybe even feeling some of this pressure. Um, if you have kids, and they're having a hard time entering the housing market. So um, the supply is not aligned with the demand, then maybe there's some market opportunities that this is presenting for us. So if we're looking at the housing shortage, I think it's important to look at who's being most affected and who can we best serve from here. <laughs> so looking at that more closely, this chart is highlighting the median household income by racial division. And the second bar is for white households. And um, that level up there is 100K. So the people that are in the best position to obtain homes right now are white households, and pretty much everyone else has a disadvantage. So particularly our community members of color um, are having a lot of challenges there. Um, I think we also can see um, the first bar is the average for everybody. So this is all. Um, because we have more white people than the others that skewed. Does that make sense? And then the other really low bar over here is um, our Native American community members. This graphic is from Seattle.gov, and this is exploring the poverty ratios per grouping. So these are some of the people that are being most heavily impacted by the housing issue. And from here, we see that um, people of color, about 25% of them, are living in poverty. And this is conservative, very conservative numbers, because the state's idea of what poverty is is probably different than what you and I 
idea of poverty based on, you know, can you, are you living off your credit card or are you living off your income? So definitely a difference of opinion there, but um, it's a good indication. We see that people with disabilities, 30% of them are living in poverty, so they're definitely a group that we can better serve as well as 33% of single parent female headed families. So any single moms out there are definitely feeling the, feeling the heat on, on this issue. Another one that I wanted to highlight also was gig economy workers. I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with what the gig economy is, but um, basically think of Uber or Uber Eats, a lot of those sorts of um, new jobs that are coming about where you're basically your own boss, how many hours you want to work. Lenders don't necessarily know how to handle that when they're validating your income to determine whether or not you can qualify for that home loan. So that's another big issue today that had the infrastructure hasn't really caught up to the market. And then here I have a little funny <laughs> graphic and some sense of humor, but um, one in three millennials are living with their parents still. Maybe some of you have them in your basement <laughs> or um, in a closet. <laughs> I don't know. But, um, yeah, so that's a 10% increase since 2000, approximately. So we're definitely feeling the heat there. So what's needed, um, this is, I want you guys to be able to see this better. Um, let's see here, we can see. Okay, that's not happening. Um, well, what this says, I'll just highlight one of them since there, there's a list, but if any of you guys want this data, I can show it to you I or send you this presentation so you can kind of go through it a little bit slower and kind of ingest it a little bit more, um, but the number of households, it has the number of households with a certain income bracket and then the percentage in Seattle and the percentage in Washington and also the aggregate number of those people. So you can kind of figure out, okay, how, how big is the market in terms of income in certain areas? And if you break that down into what's affordable for a home, we have, for example, 20,000 people that probably need housing around $500 a month. And that's nowhere to be found. So $300 a month, $350 a month, especially people with disabilities that might not have um, the same income opportunities or the same um, income potential depending. So I think as a culture and a society, especially in Seattle, especially in Washington, we have to decide whether or not we're going to create market solutions to incorporate these people and make them feel included and to thrive. So I think the numbers show that there's plenty of demand for it. It's just a matter of can we create market solutions that are aligned to those people. So this up here is a little house that's listed, I believe it's in Renton, and that's $115,000. So I definitely think we have to evaluate um, if, what are we offering people? If that's all you can get with $150,000, obviously there's other options, but not a lot. So I think we have to take that into consideration. So this I said, let's flip the chart. That bar right there, the dark gray on the end, <laughs> those are people that are spending more than 50% of their income on housing. And this is for King County. And that's not people that are making $200,000 a year that are spending 50% of their income. That's people that are making $20,000 a year that are spending 50% of their income. So um, what I'd say is we need to flip this chart. Those bars need to be higher on this side if we want to really give people an opportunity to thrive in our society, to be entrepreneurs, to be artists, things that we all value on a cultural level. We need to make sure that we're adjusting the market to be able to uplift these community members, especially historically disadvantaged um, groups. So I think that's a key factor we can take into consideration in our further development. Looking at Seattle Metro rents, 
So rents is another issue. We're not only seeing housing growth just in terms of um, valuation explode, we're also seeing the rent <laughs> valuation explode. So just in the last year, if you live in Seattle, your rent probably when it's time to sign your lease for the next year, it's your landlord's probably raised your rent. And the data is showing that it's about by 5%. And um, our wages aren't keeping up with that. So this is from National Association of Realtors. They said that 44% of people, if their rent increases, will try to find a cheaper property, find a roommate, or move in with family. And that's nationally. So it's probably even more extreme here. And um, the main reason why people aren't already owning a home is because they can't afford it. Which seems obvious, but just so you know, the data shows that that's also true. <laughs> Um, and then, so this graph shows that effectively most of the economic growth for our community members um, has gone to the people who are already extremely wealthy. The people that are struggling, that are not making a lot of money <laughs> depending on their jobs, we have people at cashiers, um, food service, um, even home care, or a lot of just day-to-day -day service people that we work with, that we enjoy, that uh, offer a lot of value to our society, aren't being valued with in the same way as top CEOs and executives, which are taking um, the top 1% in Washington State um, increased their income by 138% since 1979. Whereas the bottom 50% only increased by 15%. So people on the bottom aren't making very much more money, <laughs> and the people at the top are making a lot more money. <laughs> so um, I think we have to take that into consideration when we're looking at housing for the future is <laughs> how can we make sure that we're creating housing that's affordable for people so that they can lift themselves out of poverty or not struggle quite so hard, have more money to put their kids in extracurriculars, have more money to take that extra class, whatever it is, to enrich their lives so they can enrich our society. So this is another graph um, from Washington. Most of my presentations graphs, I haven't figured that out <laughs> yet. Um, but this shows from 2009-2013 that 124% um, of income growth went to the top 1%, whereas only 20, uh, the bottom 99% actually had a decrease. So if we're looking at what's available, um, this is a Zillow search I did today, and the search terms were 50K to 150K. Is there a starter home available for somebody that makes $50,000 a year? And there's three. <laughs> there's three on Zillow. Uh, the first one is actually out of Seattle. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Yep, thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> and the other one's like a tree house, which actually looks really cool. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, and I don't think, I think the road had washed away to get to it. <laughs> Yeah, no utilities to the house, what I'm hearing, so, yeah. This is as of this afternoon, yeah. Maybe not, <laughs> I don't know. These were some pretty fresh listings. I also did a search for uh, Renton, all the way up to 250K, so I increased the number of what we would spend, and there were six homes for sale. Yes, yeah. Um, I, yeah, I worked with one realtor who um, services, like, works specifically with Spanish speakers, <laughs> and, um, and she had, like, four people put offers on houses, and they all lost their offers in bidding wars. Yeah, like, a month and a half ago. 
And that's driving up the inflation even higher because there's people all competing for these houses. So it's like just, it's not even making sense. And the other thing that that's bringing a problem is that lenders will only lend you up to the appraised value of your home. And so just because the market is fighting for that home and thinks that, you know, this person's willing to pay more for it, if the bank doesn't think that that house is worth that much, you can't get financing for it. So unless you have cash or a wealthy relative, you're probably not going to get that house. So what can we do about it? Build tiny homes for rent and for sale. If you are a property owner and you have space in your backyard, you can be a part of the solution by building and putting a tiny home on your property. If you are a developer, if you're a builder, I think definitely starting to build smaller. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about market indications of why this is a good move. Obviously, everyone's going to benefit. Um, I think we know this. I think parents are super stoked not to have their 25-year-old living in their house anymore. <laughs> and I think um, we can agree on that. And then also to know that we're taking care of our people that are a little bit disadvantaged in one way or another because we still see their value to our community and to our society and that we're going to make sure that we're taking care of them. Um, this is Maslow's hierarchy of needs and at the bottom of it is shelter. So I think that's something we all know. It's hard to advance our lives if we don't feel like we have somewhere safe, clean, and healthy to go to bed at night. So we know we need affordable housing, but how do we know people want tiny homes? Well, this is a, a graph of the Google Trends for the search of tiny homes. And it's gone up from um, like about 25%, almost to 100% in relative frequency. So um, that means that people are digging on tiny homes. And this is by subregion, and Washington is one of the third most popular states for the search term. Alaska and Colorado. Maine is also a really big one. It, like, it depends on the day that you check this. It kind of fluctuates a little bit. Um, but Maine's another one. And then this one is the cost to build a tiny home. So I just changed the query a little bit. And um, in October 2017, we had like a, a peak all-time high of like 92. So you can see like five years ago, there wasn't a lot of interest. But now, given the market conditions, like people are like, this is what we need to do. <laughs> so the data doesn't lie. <laughs> and Facebook says so too. I did a, um, I got went into the backside of Facebook and looked at the marketing uh, platform and I typed in a query to figure out if I wanted to advertise to this audience. Uh, how many people are there? And I really wish you could see this because it would be a lot more powerful. <laughs> um, but I'll tell you what it says. So here is the detailed targeting in this list. And on the top there, I have interest groups of people who are interested in tiny homes, the tiny home movement, and then a few other like tiny house block, tiny house nation. And then I filtered it by they have to also be renters. And then they have to also make less than $75,000 a year. And in Washington, there's 8,500 8, of those people. And in Seattle, within 50 miles of Seattle, there's 4,400 people that make less than 75K a year, that want a tiny home, and that are renters. So if you're a builder, this is, the, this is your market. This is, these are the, they're there. <laughs> and you can reach them through Facebook if you need to. So the question when we talk about tiny homes is, uh, the question of what you want to own is actually a question of how you want to live your life. And I think we're seeing a big push towards tiny homes for that reason. We're seeing more awareness about, um, about our environment, about our impact on the environment, and also about having financial freedom and what that does for us. When we aren't spending 40% of our income on our house just to live, we're able to spend that money on our friends and on our family and um, supporting local businesses by going out to eat more. I know that number one thing when I have extra money is I go eat more. <laughs> I eat at nicer restaurants or I buy the more expensive thing on the menu. So I'm sure that I'm not the only one there. And so it's just good for our community, especially the local movement. Um, this is a Pinterest page called Tiny House Collective. They have 6 million monthly viewers. 
So I think that definitely shows that this is gaining a lot of traction. And I'm not going to dwell on this. This is the National Association of Realtors. They said that 83% of home purchases last year were detached single family homes. So it's definitely still what people want. Yes, multi-housing, when it's done right, I think there's a huge appeal for that and a lot of people want that as well. But that's already what we put 52% or 62% last year was multifamily. We're not replacing all of those homes that were converted into rentals with new single family homes. Like that's the smallest area of growth as it is right now. So if you're a builder or a developer, that's really the biggest uh, gap to fill. And then the most important factors to recent home buyers is the neighborhood, convenience to a job, and overall, uh, excuse me, overall home affordability. Which I think with tiny homes, if they're done intentionally and consciously, can definitely fulfill all three of those. Building stronger social connections. Um, so I wanted to highlight a few quick other social trends to consider if you're a builder um, or developer about what's What's the demand? What do people want? What are people thinking about? What do they care about? And according to Pinterest analytic data, which I love, Pinterest is a, a search engine. Basically, you think of it kind of with like housewives, but actually a lot of people use Pinterest. <laughs> and um, they analyze, you know, what are people saving? What are they clicking on? And all that sort of stuff. And they publish it every year. And this last year, they saw that there was a 750% increase in eco-friendly clothing, so that's a win for the green movement. Yes. And then <laughs> uh, also a 933% increase for a camper remodel, or just people wanting to, things related to that also. So um, basically in Pinterest words, people want a simpler life. And I think we're seeing that a lot with the rise of minimalism and the zero waste movement. So definitely there's additional cues that are saying, hey, this is, this is the, where the market's going, and we can see on the adoption curve that there's people that are the early adopters, and then there's always people that are a little, they'll follow the herd, <laughs> so to speak, um, but there's a, enough need for this, and then now it's cool, like this is the thing to do. <laughs> um, another thing I wanted to highlight was um, the plant-based movement has gained tremendous traction in the last year. We see from Pinterest that plant proteins um, has risen 417%, and vegan desserts was 329%, and then also a few others which are just random was um, air purifier and air purifying plants was 270, which to me says people care more about living in healthy homes. They care about the quality of their air. They don't want things being off gas. They also want to be closer to nature um, and incorporate biophilia into their homes. And then another one that I thought was funny but might be relevant <laughs> was colorful doors was up 121%. <laughs> so just a few things I thought were important to note, um, thought were cool. And then breaking news, Costco sold a million organic vegan burgers in 60 days. They just launched this product to test it out, and it was went like wildfire. So what that tells us is the main reason why people are choosing a plant-based lifestyle is because um, there's environmental reasons, there's health reasons, and then there's like ethical reasons. Um, and the reason why it, it pertains to this group and all of you is that uh, environment and health are two of the key things that we care about. And so do vegans, and so do plant-based community. And so we're seeing that grow tremendously. Beyonce just told um, a bunch of people at a concert to go vegan. So Beyonce is doing it, and we got to pay attention. <laughs> um, but the five reasons, uh, this is, I just found some social graphics to show you guys. Um, one of them is to conserve fossil fuels, conserve water. It uses grain efficient, efficiently, and it conserves topsoil and saves rainforests. This other one says, animal agriculture is responsible for 91% of Amazon destruction. And the other one says, 1% 1 going vegan saves over 1.3 million gallons of water per year. So the, that just kind of shows you that this is what people care about in this particular movement. 
And this movement's gaining a lot of traction, and that's your market for these tiny homes. That's your market for these green buildings. So there's a lot of overlap there. So I definitely just wanted to highlight that um, as a way to identify your market if you're doing any digital marketing. And then also just to show that this is where our social organism is headed. Um, and this is just showing that Washington is one of the key states for that demographic. There's a high correlation there. So I'll leave you with a call to action to start building and living tiny because I think people are all ready to move that direction. There's obviously a huge need. This is um, a popular topic for people. So I will introduce Sam so he can get into the nitty gritty of the fun stuff. Now that you kind of have some perspective of how to interpret it. Thank you. Let's see, where am I supposed to stand? Up here? Just don't block the screen. Just don't. If I feel uncomfortable with the light, it's the wrong spot. So thank you for, for having me here. I feel um, just honored to be connected to Northwest Eco Building Guild. You guys have been um, incredible support to lots of our team team members individually over the years, um, and then also to us just corporately. Um, it's just a really great organization. And I'm, the agenda that I have in my mind um, for today is to just give you a little background on who Green Canopy is, and um, so that way you have context for the story that I'm going to tell. And the story that I'm going to tell is going to be about the movement that we're connected to and the points in the story that are the most important to me. So we're going to be talking about finding your tribe, mapping the system, setting your vision, scoping your vision, financing your vision, and having fun. And it's actually a really important part this process. Um, so just a little bit, bit of background around uh, who I am. Uh, my background is in residential real estate appraisal, and so I'm a licensed and certified appraiser in Washington State and Oregon State. And when uh, one of my best friends, Aaron Fairchild, and I started talking about working on a project, it took like seven years before a hypothetical project turned into Green Canopy Homes. Actually, longer than that. <laughs> like nine years. And we would have coffee, talk about what we're passionate about, and oftentimes he would just say, yeah, there's not enough scale. It's not interesting to me. Um, but in 2008, 2009, um, I just finished building a five-star built green home that recycles all its own rainwater for toilets, laundry, um, irrigation. It's one of the first ones um, done legally. There are a lot of people here probably did it illegally prior to that point, but if Apparently, it was one of the first ones that was legal, and Aaron had just finished completing some um, financial analysis and modeling on energy efficiency for the city of Seattle and the city of Portland. And we kind of came together in this moment where we thought, wow, in 2008, we could see that something was going to shift in the future, and it felt like there was momentum around green building. And, um, and also, more importantly than that, we felt like there was something wrong around us, that we were excited to be um, a part of a movement. And uh, thankfully, because of Aaron's leadership, so often we think about problems that we're trying to solve as this awful thing that we're trying to um, combat. In fact, that's one of, one of our first um, uh, mission statements is we're going to combat climate change, you know, the spread of a really warring kind of language. And he comes, he has an MBA from uh, UW Foster School, so I always make fun of him. It's like, it's this patriarchal, we're going to, you know, combat and conquer climate change. But I think since then, we've all, um, Aaron and I both have grown and changed. And one of the ways that we've grown is looking at problems that we're trying to solve not as problems, but actually puzzles or even opportunities. 
And actually embracing the opportunity is something that we can engage with joy, love, laughter, fun. It's actually more effective that way. You can actually do it joyfully. And that's one of the things I just love about the tiny house movement. It is, there is this um, uh, fantastical, playful spirit about it. And um, if it's okay with you guys, I'm going to engage with you throughout this uh, presentation. Not so much a presentation, a story. Um, I don't know if I, when I first uh, talked to Pat about this presentation, I was like, I don't know if I feel super qualified to talk about this, but then as I was thinking about it more, it's not so much about me being qualified or me being a done product. Far from that, it's more that I have a story to tell and a process that I can share with you that you might be able to replicate in your own way for your own vision. So for us, our vision was to do something fun, exciting and transformative around climate change. In housing, of course, as we know, very little has changed in the last hundred years in terms of the way we've built homes, and they've just gotten bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. I was expecting to see that graph, Hannah, where the houses just keep on getting more and more bloated. Um, I was a little disappointed. It's okay. Um, oh, perfect. <laughs> Especially when we think about the fact that a new New York City is being built every month in the world in order to house the growing population, something's got to change in the way in which we build homes. And instead of it being this scary thing, what if it was this joyful interaction and engagement with something that we see as an opportunity? So our answer was to start being canopy homes. And we realized that one of the most important things even though for a lot of builders, the model is to keep it small, keep the overhead low, and um, you know, earn profits and try to funnel that up to a couple of principles. We did the most stupid financial thing and sold a lot of equity to impact investors in the Pacific Northwest. So we're owned by impact investors who care about stuff like drawdown, care about community uh, development, community values, rebuilding, and also we're co-owned by employees in the company. And one of the things about having a tribe is that it's not as big of a labor as in like you go to work and it's like it's all on you to first of all fix climate change or to try to do something <laughs> as hard as construction. We all know how difficult it is from financing all the way to sales. There are a lot of steps and lots of specialties. So for us, because of the scale that we wanted to achieve, finding your tribe became one of the most important things. And you guys figured that out here too, right? The guild is one of the most important ways that you can stop yourself from being discouraged because when you can't carry the weight on your own, you need someone else to tell you that you're not screwed up, you're not backed up, you are in process, you're new here. I've been here for 40 years. I am new on this planet. I don't know how to build more tiny homes. I need all of your help to help um, keep each other encouraged and keep me encouraged in this movement. Another way that we are able to retain the, the way in which we build, not just what we build, but how we do it together, is that we have a cohesive set of values. So our current values that we review every, our values every year, and then we update them with new language um, our values this year that we review each other on is authentic communication, cultivating community, and excellence. And more important than the values themselves are the mantras that we use to help describe what it is that we want to live into. For example, we have this mantra for excellence, which is quit doing your second job. And for us, the second job is um, oftentimes uh, there's been studies done that the majority of your energy at work is actually spent trying to look good instead of actually just doing your job. So we point out when someone's saying, oh, man, I was up so late, and I sent that email with that plan at 10.30, and it was like, yeah, it's kind of second job, you know? So we have this way of building a culture around the work that we do. This is our theory of change. And this is the purpose for why we work together as a tribe. And it's really hard to read, isn't it? So I'm going to read it for you. Um, 
So we believe we live in a future where impact investors can earn profits, where communities are resilient and inclusive, net zero energy homes become the norm, good homes are affordable, and wild lands are improved, are preserved. And so the way we think about our homes is not that we build our homes to make a profit. We think of it as we build our homes to employ our team to make an impact, to make, home, make sure that net zero energy homes become the norm, and that impact investors actually make a profit rather than um, invest in projects that may not earn a return. So the way in which we try to address some of these issues that we're grappling with is looking at systems diagrams, and don't worry, you're not supposed to read that. It's just an example of the fact that most of these issues that we're grappling with are really complicated, and so you can't do everything, but you can break down the system and understand what leverage point you are trying to address. And what's interesting is that in this room, everyone is interested in tiny homes, but I don't actually know why you are interested in tiny homes. There's something about it that makes you curious, that you want to try to solve something. Um, so I'm just curious, Kim, I'm just going to pick on you for just a second. What is it that's interesting to you about tiny homes? Uh, well, I really like this one. And I think John made a John Payne video Sunday, and that was totally exciting. Awesome. Yes. Yeah, the zero waste presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Um, why is smaller better? More affordable. More affordable, thank you. And why is affordable important? Because uh, the majority of people are getting evicted and start off in rent, so if you create a way to live that's affordable, you can buy it. Why do, why do we care about people not able to not being able to afford their skyrocket rents? They don't, but I spent almost seven years homeless. It took me 10 years to find affordable housing. Wonderful. That's empathy. And why, 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 why? Unfortunately, and more actually excitedly, it's because of love. At the end of the day, when you look at the deep down things that you really care about that, that are as impractical, that seemingly impractical as tiny homes, when it comes down to some of the transformational work that you do, it is going to come down to love. I'm going to get back to that in a second. Love wins. So the way in which we think about those social and environmental, it used to say <coughs> problems, um, and I switched it up and called them opportunities. We think about them in a few categories. So resource scarcity. The housing crisis, when we first started Green Canopy Homes, we focused 100% on a remodel, so we did over about 70 deep green remodels, and then since then the market, and that was in 2010 to 2013, and then since then the market flipped, and now we're 100% new construction, so in terms of what we're focusing on now, we have about 150 or so homes in process um, at all different uh, points in the process, all the way from design all the way to listed. Um, and uh, now they're all new construction, just because that's where the market has gone, and also that's our approach to scale. So we're also um, focusing on urban sprawl, so we build high-density projects in fill, and then also quality investments, trying to impact the impact investment space as well, because if you're able to have an effect and transform the way impact or investments uh, returns are made, you have even more leverage to affect lots of different businesses and modes. So why net zero energy? Why is that a leverage point for us? And I'll just go through this really quickly because you guys are, are totally already there. Um, <coughs> what was astounding to me last year in 2017, we switched our entire uh, spec from four or five star Bill Green or um, Platinum certified Earth Advantage in Portland to net zero energy. So from August of 2017 moving forward, and as you know, 
entitlement takes a long time, but all projects moving forward are going to be net zero energy. And when we were doing the research on what we were going to be able to rely on for comps, we were astounded to find that in 20 years since solar panels have become available retail, in 20 years of real estate activity in Seattle and Portland metro combined, there were seven homes that were net zero energy. Seven homes total. Now, lots of you may have built net zero energy homes, but you live in them. So we're talking about transactions on the Northwest MLS or the IMLS. So we we are uh, firm believers in the fact that in order to change the system, you need to affect a leverage point. One of the main leverage points is comps. If other builders see that double pane windows are the norm, well, guess what? The market starts to demand that double pane windows are the norm. The market starts to demand that when the market starts to demand that, then the financing uh, system around that starts to change. The market starts to change. I mean, then it just starts to snowball. So we realize that someone needs to take that step out there and take that risk, and our investors back us to take that risk. And why 80% AMI? A lot of people ask us that question, um, and it's a fair question. You know, there are a lot of people that make a lot less than 80% AMI, and AMI stands for Area Median Income. Um, we focus on um, social sustainability in that particular income bracket um, in this new fund structure that we've created. Um, and just to explain the structure, in a project where we have four townhome units, 25%, so one unit will be designated 80% AMI income or less in terms of income for a rental period of about seven to 10 years. And after that seven to 10 year period, the pool of properties in this fund that we've created, 25% of those left over that are renter, rentals will be designated um, long-term permanent affordability for home ownership at, again, the 80% AMI mark. And the reason why we were looking at that as a very important leverage point is, first of all, there are no government subsidies for people at that income uh, bracket, but the need is still very, you know, is great. Two, we need to tr prove a model where without government subsidy, we are able to build a model where our impact investors can make a return while still delivering a number of affordable rentals and affordable homeowner <laughs> units um, in a place like Capitol Hill or in a place like Northeast Portland in Alberta. So um, if you can prove it in these hot markets and show that you're still able to deliver affordable homes um, within a market structure when impact investors make returns, then you can start to to uh, create some imagination in the finance, in the finance markets. Um, my capital team's been telling me to say finance, not finance, because if you say finance, you're clearly not in finance. So just a note, say finance. Um, social, um, the way in which we think about return, instead of just looking on the left column where you see, it's hard to see, 22 to 26% return, internal rate of return. That's a typical um, high yield, speculative uh, fund return profile. Unfortunately, as you see on this lower section, there are a lot of negative externalities that come out of doing business as usual. All of you know that in this room. But we don't count that on our balance sheet. We don't count that in the returns. We don't say, oh, there's, you know, how many tons of PVC um, outflow from the last year? Well, it's just right here, but the investors don't worry about that because we don't have to worry about that. Or um, forests that are basically just clear cut and um, all the chemicals that are sprayed to try to keep down the fast growth and all of those chemicals running into the stream and poisoning our fish. Guess what? That's in that return up there, the 22 to 26% return. What we're trying to do is take one step towards a model where there's positive, dark green is positive social and environmental return, balanced with an 8 to 11 percent internal rate of return that's financial. And so that's how we're able to afford to build affordable units for rent and long-term affordable units that will get deeded to a land trust permanently. 
And also that's how we're able to afford to build net zero energy when there are no net zero energy comps yet. So we're selling net zero energy at market par. That's our expectation. So I'm going to get into the next piece, which is I'm going to show you five different examples of tiny homes. Um, yeah, typologies, five different typologies that we are involved in. Um, so going back to the pathway for how you start your own work, it starts with love. So it starts with going back to the courage that's required in order for you to go out and break the model. You're already talking about, we've already been talking about the different transformation and the need. Be very specific about what it is that you want to see happen. Passion isn't something that you earn. It's like wind, it just lands on you. So pay attention to what that passion is about, is about so you can be very specific about it. Think about the capacity that you're building because if you build one home, that's not the end. It's part of a process, right? So what is the capacity that you are specifically trying to build over the long term? It could be something as simple as a home for your family, but this is part of a movement, right? And then how will you achieve your goals? Going back to the steps that I just covered, it's the idea of first finding your tribe, which you guys have already done here in this room, mapping the system, setting the vision, scoping your vision, financing your vision, and then having fun. And that last part is really important because that's how you learn. If you put yourself in a place where you're actually really enjoying, you see kids playing, that's in their highest um, rate of learning. Um, that's the phase that they're in when they're playing. Okay, to your point, moving quickly here. Quicker, quicker. Um, so traditional tiny homes. Um, this is where, when I was talking to Pat, I was feeling a little bit like, oh, do I? I'm thinking 250 square feet, that's a tiny home. But the reality is some of the homes that we're building or planning um, are in the range of 700 square feet, 750 or less, and that is not conforming. There are very few homes that are in that size range. And here, um, this is a project that we're in process. Um, this is a six plat development, but as you can see, there are, yeah, there are 12 little squares there. On the left is a row of tiny homes, and on the right is a row of more standard conventional homes that are in the 2,000 or so square foot realm. These are all net zero energy. But on the left, you're going to be asking, how in Seattle, this is a Seattle project, are you able to have, then um, we, we would sell them off individually. So what we would do is we would build these as, um, as a project, after the land, first you do the land use, so you do the subdivision first, and then you get your building permit, and you do the building permit with an ADU. And then after that, concurrent with construction, you can do a condo plant. And the condo plan allows you to create the legal structure that is not um, governed by the, uh, the city of Seattle, but is actually a, um, a civil matter. Then you create this deed structure that allows you to sell a condo unit. And any of the shared services, for example, this driveway becomes one of the shared services for the condo that the condo manages. Um, because it becomes the thing that you're paying those dues for. But besides that, it's a very simple structure. And so for us, it was a way we were excited about adding some tiny units to this West Seattle lot. In this case, the bigger homes would be looking out into a ravine. It's a nice view. And on the left side, the street fronting ADUs would be about 700 square feet. So, um, yeah, about 700 square feet, not including a loft that would be sitting above the, uh, the bedroom. So there would be an angled roof in order to be oriented to the south for the, um, for the solar exposure. And the idea is also it's all on one level. So it allows for different uh, population groups to feel really comfortable about saying, yes, I can age in, age in place here, or I can have kids running around, and there's the loft might be for adults, for example. And this would be priced 
competitively to an attached two-bedroom townhome. So that's the idea, is trying to build something that, even though a 1,200 or 1,300 square foot townhome would be priced about the same as this, it's pretty competitive when you think about how much more outdoor area you have in this setting versus some of those townhome projects that you see that are so common in Seattle. So we love this project. Um, some of the tricks that are, um, or some of the opportunities I think also is that when you are able to build a cluster of projects, you're able to build smaller homes at a scale, which means that what is usually like a $400 to $500 per foot price tag, you're able to just integrate that whole framing package or that whole foundation package with the whole project, and all of a sudden you're paying a price per foot number instead of a mobilization fee in addition to a very, very small project. All of a sudden the number uh, in relation to your size of your home is really high if you're just doing one tiny home. In this case, we're able to add some scale, and the siders that are doing that one project are able to go all the way around. So this is one of the ways in which we think about how do you impact that scale. I had some thoughts around the traditional tiny home out in the woods, but I think I'll just save that for later, because we'll just, I'll just talk about my story. Um, or Green Canopy story. So something else we're doing um, in Portland, what's nice about Portland Code is that um, you're able to add ADUs without parking. So one of the most, one of the biggest tricks, like a question that people ask all the time is, so why, why aren't there more ADUs in Seattle? What is with that? The problem is the city's code currently, thanks to my neighborhood, Queen Anne, um, has been opposing any kind of uh, code change to ADUs, especially as it relates to the parking requirement. So, in, but in Portland, you're able to develop ADUs that um, do not have parking. And in this particular case, it's a similar setup to what I just described in that you would develop a duplex up high and then detached ADUs, well, they're attached to one another, but they're detached from the main structure. Accessory dwelling unit. And when you're done with getting your building permit, again, you can do a condo plat and sell them off separately. You can also sell them as a unit, a, a large uh, unit one and an ADU connected to it. But what we're realizing is that there's such a high demand for lower price point units that running the condo plat has become a method of, um, of adding more density, adding more units for sale. So we have maybe a dozen or so projects that are similar to that. They're tiny townhomes. So this picture is of a project in Eastlake, and this set the record for the tiniest townhome um, actually in that particular MLS area. Um, so this, this little tiny um, townhome is only, I'm trying to remember, 715 square feet, which doesn't seem that small until you think about the fact that there's three levels, right? So this was an alternative to what typ people typically thought of as townhomes in that, you know, on the ground level, you have the kitchen, the next level up above that is the living room, and the next level above that is the bedroom. And it was kind of a tricky, um, tricky unit to sell, and I think there's lots of things we learned from this particular project um, in terms of setting expectations early. Um, it, it was a successful project, but this is something that we need to continue to do. More dense units to serve certain parts of the population. Not that all of them need to be this way, but it was one of those uh, projects that a lot of people were like, could anyone even possibly live in that? There's no way. You're never going to be able to sell that. So it was a little bit of a risk, but after when we were in the market, there were tons of people that were interested. They couldn't envision, um, they couldn't envision the multi-levels, and that's actually one of the tricks with the code, or one of the tricks with land use and the market, the combination of land use and the market in the townhome LR1, LR2, LR3 zones in Seattle. And it's actually the same in Portland, for example, in the R1 zones. Oftentimes you buy a lot and there is a certain 
market yield for that lot on the square footage and on the street frontage of each of these lots. You can't just say, well, I'm just going to build tiny homes, so I'm only going to build six units and they're going to be 600 square feet a piece because you have to compete with six other builders who are going to pay 1.5 million and your pro forma can only work at 700,000. So the trick is you still have to provide that same yield and you have to figure out how to still make a more vertical living space marketable. And so for us, we try to go after projects where there might be some open space. You're not using the, the floor area ratio, the FAR. So every project you try to maximize as much development capacity as you possibly can because that's the only way you're able to buy land. Um, you have to try to increase the yield to match the market price of the land. So even though a lot of people say, oh, in Seattle it must be so great because the prices are just continuing to move on. You must be doing really well, right? The problem is we also have to buy at that same increased price. It makes it harder and harder for us to build smaller, more affordable units. So that's why you see so many buildings getting bigger and bigger and bigger and getting bloated. Well, this one sold for five eighty-four in Lego. He's like Yeah, that's market shock, huh? <laughs> so this is another way of thinking about tiny homes. Is oftentimes we think about the little cottage in the woods. It's definitely our um, traditional view of that. But co-housing and co-living is a new way of thinking about how do we share resources, how do we build more efficiently and create more density so that way we can bring more people closer to job centers and transportation. So we have a project that we're trying to get going, um, I believe we will, in, um, off of Williams, if you're familiar with Portland, in northeast Portland. With this, this is an area where there's lots of beer, beards, baristas, um, barbers, I guess. Um, and it's a great walkable location. Um, no parking required because there's actually great transportation in Portland and great biking. Um, and instead of taking the traditional route of doing 40 um, one bedroom or, um, or studio style apartments, what we are planning is doing co-living units. So this is still an apartment, but there are 11 units that are more around 200 to 250 square feet that share a kitchen and share a balcony and share a dining table. And so this is at, on each level uh, two times over. So 11 on one side, 11 on the other side. So it's basically kind of like um, dorms for people that want to enjoy the community aspect of, um, of living in a space where you're sharing, um, sharing values and then also sharing resources. Now, the first thing that, that people say is what I just said. Oh, co-living, that's like dorms, right? And I would say yes. But also, there's another aspect of it, which is when you're able to provide this kind of a home with a game room at the lower level, a roof deck at the top level, you walk out the door and you're already right next to your favorite bar, and transportation is plentiful, and you're able to curate values and curate experience, and you're also able to have higher cooks to come in if you so choose to be in that level. You can have your pet level Cat level is probably at the very, very top, I think. Um, you're able to actually have a really enjoyable experience. So as I was working on the development of this um, conceptual design, I was starting to feel like, huh, maybe co-living for families too. I mean, this is really fun to imagine what that looks like. In the same way, co-housing, um, we are not involved in a co-housing project right now. Lots of friends are working on it. I'm sure there's lots of friends um, with the guild that are working on co-housing. It's a more tricky proposition because you, um, and I won't go into that because I don't know enough about it, but it's the same, a similar concept in that we're actually allowing the community development to be a part of the value add, not the subtractive piece, which is like, oh, I can't live in a traditional apartment. It's actually better and it actually costs less. Um, so I did tour a couple projects um, that was, uh, that were managed by Open Door, which is a, a company that manages co-living uh, apartments uh, down in the um, Bay Area in California. And one of the things I noticed 
Um, that was a stark difference between a traditional apartment and a co-living apartment was that people were talking to each other. Do you ever see apartments? Like how people just pass by and like don't make eye contact and just like, oh, like people do not look happy. And no one knew who I was. I was just touring. I could have been someone that was looking to live in this co-living apartment. But people looked genuinely happy and connected to one another because when you start sharing food, sharing experiences, guess what? You build community. Some of the things that we are working on right now that hopefully will continue to push this movement forward is that we are working on panelization to try to um, integrate more efficiency and FSC certified wood into the uh, production stream that is currently broken. FSC is very difficult, as you guys know, very difficult to get. Um, and it costs a lot more. So we're trying to see how we can potentially manufacture panels of walls off-site, integrate FSC certified wood, and then try to make the, um, uh, cut down on the waste, and then also make it affordable, um, not just for us to build with, but we're hoping in years to come that we'll be able to, um, to work with other builders as well. So it's definitely a coming attraction. I, we, <laughs> we don't know how long it's going to take, but we believe that it's going to come together. The other thing that, um, that we're thinking about, that we're working on, are condos, like true condos, flat style condos. Um, this is not the best example picture of this. This is Inkeny Row in Portland, but there are condo, the condo projects are quite difficult. Um, there are examples that we are studying right now that are in the works. Um, it's going to be difficult because of um, Washington State law and the way in which it treats lawsuits for condos. So we're um, in conversations to try to figure that out. But I do believe that it is one of the important tactics to use in the future um, in order to increase urban density and get more housing units um, in the urban environment. And with that, thank you for your attention. I appreciate it. Um, to repeat your question, who manages the HOA for a condo flat, even if it's a small one? It is tricky because basically for a two-unit condo flat, all of a sudden you just bought yourself a job, not just a home. That's the trick. Um, 
you, you still have to have a president, a secretary, a treasurer. You still have to um, file corporate returns, um, nonprofit corporate returns on an annual basis. However, if you set up a management agency to manage that for your home buyer or, um, or for yourself, if that's what you're doing, it may not be as difficult as you think. And if it's for yourself, then you're already, it's not as difficult. I mean, it's, it should be a simple filing. There should be a lot of shared amenity spaces or shared infrastructure to pay for. So the due should be very low, and that's usually what causes the problems, is high dues. You're also making sure that your shared infrastructure does not include stuff like siding or roofs. So if you do them detached, then it'll keep it really simple. Yeah, you have to. How do you feel like Portland Yeah, Portland is way easier, um, way, way easier because specifically the parking, and also they are a lot more, they have a lot more leeway in terms of the number of ADUs. You can accessory dwelling units that you can permit. However, even with that ease, both in Seattle and Portland, it's still 1% of see, uh, ADUs only make up 1% of the housing units. So even though it's like it's right. double in Portland, it's still less than 1%. So there's a lot of capacity there. Sorry, there's someone behind you. What we can do then to the condo lot and who you work with? Oh, who the lawyer is? is that what it was? People. I mean, legislators? Oh, oh, sorry for the condo lot. Um, that. We are not as active as I would like to be yet, so we're just having conversations, initial conversations right now. So if you have some ideas, I would love. I'm still earlier, early enough in the, those conversations that you don't know enough about how to fix those, ones, what needs to be fixed, except that it's it's basically the um, uh, the terms and the. Um, the limitations on lawsuits to the developers because basically there's lots of ambulance chasing lawyers who just automatically file lawsuits for any kind of project in, in Washington because you can always get some sort of a, um, you can always get a fee on any larger kind of project. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a little bonus with uh, some time left over, so I wanted to bring John on. And he's going to talk about how to build a tiny house. So I'm not here actually to talk about how to build a tiny house. I'm here to talk about how to learn how to build a tiny house. So first of all, I want to ask, how many of you have actually physically, I'm a builder, I'm out in the field all day. How many of you physically helped build a tiny house? Cool. And how many of you would either like to learn how to build a tiny house or like to learn more how to build a tiny house? Okay, well, I'm not waste, I'm glad to be present, presenting that. Okay, so I'm a construction contractor. I've been doing green building for a long time, and I just got a quick five-minute presentation on, on how to learn more about doing tiny houses. You know, to, to build a tiny house, I'm not talking about the permit process, the financing, the legal structure. I'm talking about physically building these puppies. And so you need to learn particular skills if you're doing it on your own or if you're doing it with a professional company that's actually getting involved in it. So you need, you know, one option is to learning skills for carpentry is very important. Electrician, electrical skills are important. Roofing is important. Organization and business skills are pretty handy too as part of the whole overall process. So it's good to learn about tiny houses. This has been one meeting where you can learn about certain aspects of it, but there's a zillion different opportunities out there, a few of which I'll be mentioning, that you can learn about tiny houses. Getting volunteer experience, and there's a number of different places you can get volunteer experience or professional experience as an apprentice or as a laborer is a good way of doing it. Going to these type of meetings and and meeting people is a really good thing. Networking is a really good thing. And hopefully you'll meet people, hang out here and talk to people and meet other people while you're here. If you really want to get to know people in the circle, volunteer for the guild or volunteer for people with the tiny house network. That's bad. <laughs> okay. Next one. So learning opportunities. The thing to know is the construction. The key thing in my mind is the construction industry is very cyclic. 
in slow times, there's not a lot of work for people trying to break in. Right now, we're at an incredible construction boom in the Seattle area and probably nationally, particularly in the Seattle area. And there's a labor shortage. So there's a lot of opportunities for people to come and get experience that may not have a experience otherwise. Us construction people, it's challenging finding good workers right now, challenging finding good laborers. So there's a lot of us who would be glad to have someone who, who could bring some good skills to the, the job site as, as a possibility. Um, I've had a worker working on my job site just one day a week, because that's how much time he has to have an opportunity to learn about past houses in the case of my project I'm doing right now, and that's worked out very well. Other companies may not have an interest in doing that type of thing. They're all different. There's a number of different workshops. When I Googled up uh, Tiny House Seattle, there's a number on Facebook, there's someone advertising a workshop coming up. There's a number of different things going on in their community, a number of different organizations. Habitat for Humanity is always a good place to go volunteer. They build houses with volunteers, and they must have a good training program for that. I haven't been involved with them, but I think that's an excellent thing. Sawhorse Revolution does a lot of training with low-income people trying to learn skills on how to do building. The Low Income Housing Institute, they do a lot of low income housing and they put on need volunteers at times, I believe. Okay, Denise is shaking her head, that's good. There's a number of pub publications out there. Um, I'm very involved in green building, so I like green from the ground up because that's a good basic, um, sort of like a textbook on green building for new construction. Uh, Prescription for Healthy Homes is very good about just getting the basics about how to build a healthy home or do a healthy home remodel. Um, let's see if I can scoot this over. Sorry. Very good. <laughs> um, there's a, a few different, when I did an Amazon search, there's just a ton of books on tiny houses, and some of them are very popular, very highly rated, and they look really good. Um, Modern Carpentry is my go-to book when I'm teaching someone how to build stairs, how to do different aspects of carpentry. Very good book for learning that. On YouTube, you know, these days you can learn so much on YouTube. So when I did a, a Google search on, uh, uh, for YouTube on tiny houses, there's, there's a ton of, type of really good things out there. From one of my workers on the job today, he was mentioning that there's a great podcast called The Modern Craftsman that's very good about how to get into the construction industry. And then there's training programs. Seattle Central Community College has an excellent carpentry training program. They have a training program in cabinetry and wood, wood um, boat building. Renton Community College has some good programs. Uh, North Seattle, uh, Edmonds Community College have different aspects of construction that they have for. And then it's really basic about learning all the basic skills and getting competent in that if you're building a house outside the professional ones, if you're doing it with your friends or if you're doing it on your own or if you're building up skills so that you can work for one of the companies. But in the guild, there's a lot of green building companies, uh, which if you're interested in getting experience, you know it doesn't hurt to call us and ask to say that you're willing to come help out and willing to labor or interested in doing some type of apprenticeship if you have some things to offer. Questions? <coughs> My company is Sunshine Construction. Okay. If anyone is interested in uh, building tiny houses for the homeless, I've been volunteering with the uh, Low Income Housing Institute, LEPI, for um, two and a half years, I guess, you know. And we're doing a lot more of them. And Jenny Durkin, Mayor Jenny Durkin, wants to build a thousand more. We have, I forgot how many now, 300, 200, something like that now. So it's going to be a big, big ramp up. So. You go to lehigh.org, L-I-H-I.org, there's a, just all the links to tiny houses, you can find it there. It's a thank, lot of fun, too. Thank you. Who else knows about some volunteer or other opportunities for learning about building tiny houses? So, um, Habitat for Humanity is doing its very first build north of the ship now. In Lake City, it's not very good for me. And, um, you should, if you're interested in getting involved in that, uh, usually some money in sponsorship goes with, they have, you know, more people than money, so you need both. But um, you can get on their website, get on their website. The block project is building their second house this weekend. Excellent. We built the whole panel last weekend, they're assembling it. And if someone wants to volunteer, how do they connect? Uh, 
on the bottom part of the website? Blockproject.org. Okay, very good. What other opportunities does anyone know about? There's a Seattle Tiny House University. Um, it's a guy Isaac and two friends, and they build them in people's yards and teach classes. Actually, one being built in my front yard in Wallingford. It's four weekends, like 11:00 on a Saturday. If you want to stop by, it's 42nd and Bagley this Saturday, 11:00. I won't be there, but um. It'll be a class in my front yard. You <laughs> park outside the block so you don't freak out my neighbors. <laughs> what other opportunities? Anyone know of anything else? So, Nancy, there's an uh, opportunity to review my solution to a time trial project that can be done at the uh, Ranch and Dallas Tech Center. Mm. And my company is currently hiring a tech employee. Excellent. Ooh. Excellent. Any other opportunities? Anyone knows? Anyone in the room? Great. Tiny House Meetup in Seattle. Tiny House Meetup. Seattle Tiny Houses, I think. Sign up for that. Yeah. Here soon. Have some various work parties and things like that. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, John. Okay. Um, let's give a hand to the three speakers. And uh, most of what you heard tonight is actually on the resources just that Wendy uh, prepared for us, so uh, I'll stop by and pick up one of those. And again, uh, <coughs> we're looking for volunteers. Uh, so if you have some time to help us put up the furniture away and clean up, you need to get out of here by 9.30. So uh, stick around, carry on the conversation, but um, you do need to get out of here. Okay, thanks a lot for coming.